I want to thank you for coming on the show today. To anyone that's out there, um, anyone that's tuned in today, we have a Mr. Tim Jackson with us. It is a pleasure to introduce him. He's the host of the No More OGs podcast. He's a real estate broker, author, former zoning commissioner, and Mr. Retired at 37 is what they call him. <laughs> Tim Jackson. What's going on? Are we live? <clears throat> We live, man. Oh man, okay. Well, that's what's up. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the uh I appreciate the intro. Thank you for having me on the show. Let's get into it. So, man, um, first and foremost, the name of my show is Millionaire by Morning. And you are Mr. Retired at 37. I'm yes, sir. Real estate had a whole lot to do with that. It did. It did. It had a lot to do with that, actually. And uh, again, thank you for having me. Yes, I, I did retire at the age of 37. I actually retired during the pandemic, okay. um, which is crazy because a lot of people, you know, were, were more so scrambling. But, you know, between the ages of 30 and 37 years old, I put myself in a position financially uh, to to be straight. Right. Um, I really worked my purpose. I really worked my plan. So when the pandemic came, I literally just kind of said, you know what, I'm good. Like, I, I'm, I'm straight. Like, everything's kind of going crazy right now. But you know, my primary investment is real estate and people will always, always, always need a place to stay. Um, my renters, they will, they're never going to cancel me for anything that I say on the internet. Um, you know, it's just, I, I've taught this information forever. And so I just took a break. And in that process of taking a break, I said, you know what, I'm going to start helping people find their purpose. Cause people would ask me, you know, how did you retire at the age of 37? I said, I was extremely purpose driven for you know, about seven years straight. And that's how I was able to get to, you know, from where I was to where I wanted to be. So everything worked out for me. That's awesome, man. And um, I want to get a little bit into your backstory because a lot of people don't even know where to get started. And you was purpose driven, like you say, for seven years, just totally focused. But how you're from Dallas, correct? Are Born you? and raised, Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. All right, man. Um, so yeah, take us back to Dallas, man, where it all began. I guess up until the point that you became the uh city of Dallas zoning commission. You know, so um I, I I'm one of those people I have a unique story. I moved out of the house when I was 17 years old. I graduated at the age of 17 and I moved out. My mother always jokes and says that I walked across the stage with my suitcases and my bags. But I went into the military and got a chance to see the world through the military. And I always knew I wanted to be in real estate, um, you know, because of an experience that I had, you know, in, in the 10th grade. Uh, a friend of mine, her mother was a real estate broker and she was her mother was always available. Like she would be at the school all the time. She'd always show up for events. This was that one of those friends that had a new car when they were in, you know, 10th grade. Uh, you know, it was just everything was just always super good. And I was like, what does your mom do? And she told me a real estate broker. And so, I, I, you know, this is back in the day. This is back when we had AOL, you know, those little 15 minute CDs. Yeah. <laughs> so I had I had to go to the library and look up what it was. And then I said, you know, what, that's something I want to do. So fast forward, got out the military, came back, got a good job in corporate. <clears throat> and I ended up getting my real estate license, but I never really, you know, worked real estate like I should. You know, it was just one of those have some extra money type things. And, you know, when when the jobs began to, you know, uh, in for me. And I saw that, you know, I'm the type of person that I don't have anything against a job. I'm a hard worker. But for me, I, I found myself more successful in, in situations that I control. Um, I said, you know, well, let me let me really put my all into real estate. And so that's what I did, you know, start a real estate brokerage. And it just kind of went from there. You know what I'm saying? And so between like I said, between the ages of 30 and 37, I just worked that plan like that was the only thing going. And it materialized. And, and that's what I tell people now. It's like, don't give up on what you believe in. Like, it doesn't matter how old you are. Just get started. But give it literally everything you have. Because if you just kind of half step and don't put everything into it, then you're going to get half results or no results. So, yeah. Okay, man. That's what's up. Um, and with that, you became an educator. Yes. And with being an educator, you're not just talking to talk. You're walking to walk. You have a book that's out. And this Absolutely. Book Show your book on camera. Yep. So right behind me, you'll see my book, but the book is called Real Dope, an in-depth comparison between real estate and the dope game. I just hit my seventh year anniversary on that. Um, but I wrote the book because, you know, one, everyone would always ask me, like, how did you, how are you doing what you're doing? You know, when I would go back to my old neighborhood or, you know, go to the barbershop or run to my friends and I literally just got tired of 
you know, explaining to people how I did what I did. So I wrote a book for my friends and it, it took off pretty well. Um, but, you know, after I wrote the book, you know, um, I I'd started a mentoring program around that time as well. And I started teaching this to, to boys between the ages of 10 and 18, uh, you know, going into schools. You know, I had my own nonprofit, which I still do. And, and in fact, uh, the majority of the proceeds of this book go to um, the nonprofit. At one point, 100 percent of the proceeds went to the uh, nonprofit. Um, so I always tell people, if you're buying this, you know, you're investing in, in, a, in, a, in a child. Yeah. But, you know, from there, like I said, I, I just opportunities start coming to me because I was always in the community doing something. And that's how I was able to become a, a zoning commissioner. I got appointed to that position twice. And from there, it was like it was like literally the blinders came off. I started seeing real estate for what it really was. Like all this time I had one idea of real estate, but then I realized as a zoning commissioner, like a person that actually, you know, uh, you know, voted on certain things and made decisions for the city. It was like, wow, like, you know, the average black person, not just the average person, but specifically the average black person has no clue how real estate works, specifically commercial real estate. Like we only, we own less than one millionth of a percent of all of the commercial real estate in this country. Like you think wow. about that, let's like 0. 0.0000000% It's crazy. And wow. so my thing is now is like, all right, let me start diversifying my portfolio and purchasing commercial real estate because now I understand zoning, but also teaching people how to do the same. Man, that's awesome. And I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you touched on that because that was actually my next question. So there's so many aspects of real estate. Right. Yes. So with you being a real estate broker, just for anyone who does not know the terminology, can you break down exactly what a real estate broker is? And Absolutely. Does? Absolutely. So you have um, most people are familiar with the term real estate agent or realtor. A realtor is a designation. Uh, you have to be a member of the National Associations of Realtors to be called a realtor. Um, you don't have to be a realtor to have a real estate license. Um, but a broker is who real estate agents work for. So if you want to own a real estate company, you need to possess a broker's license or uh, whether it's an individual or a corporate broker's license. And so in the state of Texas, you know, you're required to have a license uh, in real estate for so long and make so many transactions before they'll, they'll allow you to sit and test for that. And so I've been a real estate broker for... I think it's been 12 years now, maybe maybe a little bit longer. I, I got into real estate as a loan officer back in 2004. Um, and so um, this is my 19th uh, year in the industry. But I want to say I got my broker's license like in 2008 or nine. Um, and yeah, so I have agents that work under me uh, that can originate or write contracts with Texas uh, promulgated forms. OK, all right. Yeah, yeah man, that's awesome. Uh 19 years in the game. Yeah, yeah. When I tell people that, they're like, man, you don't even look like you've had any anything, you know, no job for 19 years. But <laughs> yeah, I've been around, you know, for, for two decades nearly. Well, yeah, I guess it's been two decades. So uh, I'm excited to, you know, educate people. In fact, this year I'm doing my 10 city tour um, where I'm going, you know, around to 10 cities. And we may even add five more cities to it because my goal is to guide a thousand people uh, to home ownership in 2023, a, a thousand families. So we just hit Oakland, California. Uh, I'll be in uh, Dallas this weekend, of course, um, May uh, March 3rd. So uh, uh, it'll be at the Black Academy of Arts and Letters if anyone is watching this and they want to come. Uh, when you share my link in social media, you know, everything's in the link. And then I'll hit uh, Sacramento next month, Vegas after that, um, St. Louis. I'm going to hit Atlanta, Chicago. Um, going to hit Charlotte, uh, going to hit Jacksonville, uh, and going to hit, hit Houston. So those are the ones that are on there now. And then we're thinking about adding about five more cities to it because people are really, really interested in what I'm talking about because the goal is to guide people to home ownership, like to get their first property. Okay. All right, man. That's awesome. Uh, 10 city tour this weekend in Dallas. That's on yes, sir. Friday, right? March 3rd is Friday. Yeah, March 3rd from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Black Academy of Arts and Letters, which is downtown Dallas. It's attached to the convention center. So uh, I'm actually a board member for the Millennial Board at the Black Academy. So my goal is to bring more events like this because, one, people need to learn more about that institution, its history and, you know, what it's doing uh, in the culture. Um, but, two, you know, we need to be able to, to come to a safe space uh, with people 
who look like you or people who come from your experiences, right? right? Because, you know, it's, you know, a person doesn't have to look like you to share your experience to a certain extent um, that can teach you some things that you need to know. It's time for our kids to see more people like me and more people like you who are actually doing something within the community so that they, you know, can stop looking up to entertainers and ball players and people who, you know, don't, for lack of better words, don't give a damn about them. Cause I always tell them when they, when they say they want to be a ball player or entertainer, I say, pull up your favorite ball player or entertainer. I want you to inbox them right now and ask them if they can come and speak to your school. And if they say, yeah, I'll give you a hundred dollars and I ain't paid a hundred dollars out yet. I've been doing this for seven years. <laughs> not going to. Not going I'll to. never pay that money out. You want to know why? Because that's not they get down. They get down is to make money. You know what I'm saying? I ain't knocking them. It's not their job as a ball player and an entertainer to raise our kids. It's not right. their job as a ball player and an entertainer to, to guide us or save us. That's why many of them leave, right? It's our job to take value in what we have and to take ownership in what we have and to show our children how to do the same because generational wealth isn't something it's that you hold it's something that you possess mentally and i think we get the game mixed up when we say generational wealth we think about property and money and assets no generational wealth is a mindset because if i if i make millions of dollars and i don't teach my son how to manage it then when i die notice i said when not if he gonna he can i can i curse on here i don't know the platform he gonna fuck off the money you know what i'm saying like that's the only way i can say it y'all like i'm just keeping it real so and we've seen that we've seen like, you know, typically wealth skips generations. And we have this myth in our mind, like, you know, oh, all these people have passed down all this wealth. And yeah, people have passed down wealth, but most people squander their money. That's why, you know, lottery winners give they're broke within the first you know three to five years. So, like, you know, we want to instill that generational wealth mindset, something that you possess mentally into our, our people. Uh, And by doing so, you know, I'm doing it by putting on these free events and saying, hey, what's your excuse now? Like you say you want it, come and get it. And then when I see people get online, you follow me on social media. Like when I see people get online, you know, talking about they need help. It's like I just troll them. I'm like, man, come on, man. We've been doing this for seven years and I ain't never seen you at an event. Like stop talking about these kids. These are your kids. You're putting them out there. These kids are your kids age. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or stop saying you don't have access when literally we have everything at our fingertips on social media and on the internet. You can go to YouTube and YouTube, Google, you know, type in how to do anything in the world. But it's that that mindset that needs to shift. And that's what we're creating is a shift of the mindset along with tangible instructions. Yeah. See, and and it's at your fingertips. All of this information is right there at people's fingertips. And there's no more excuses. You've been in this industry for 19 years. Yeah. It's hard to illustrate, it's hard to explain to someone that's 19 years ago that this opportunity was not available then. It wasn't, man. And Our grandparents couldn't ride on the front of the bus, man. And many of our grandparents are still alive. Like, think about that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like, that's why I make it a point not to beat up on the past generation because a lot of people beat up on their parents and they beat up on their grandparents and they say, we were never taught. We got to ask, why were we never taught? Like, they did what they could with what they had. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying they didn't have access to information. I've been in the game 19 years, and I had to go to a library at a high school to look up what a real estate broker was. A kid right now can say, hey, Siri, what's a real estate broker? And Siri would tell them. Then they can go to an AI tool and say, Siri, I mean, you know, can you, can you, or whoever, can you write me a a 1000 word, you know, essay on what a real estate broker is and the damn computer will write it for them. Right. Yeah. So what's the excuse now? We got to start putting the action and it's going to be uncomfortable. It's it, These are some uncomfortable times and some uncomfortable conversations. But with anything that you're not used to, once you start doing it, it becomes natural. That's a perfect transition. <laughs> are speaking on unnatural. I mean, uh. <laughs> <laughs> now that we are speaking on uncomfortable conversations, the reason that I reached out to you um, is because of one thing I believe you said on social media, and it was based on miseducation, I believe, or for lack of better terms, gentrification. Ah, let's get it. Yeah, man. Let's so get it. I want you to direct this this topic. I don't know. I don't like, I don't know how to explain it, but you say that it's not a bad thing. 
Gentrification is not. <laughs> Let's get into that, man. That I, I literally have become a household name on social media uh, because of my take on gentrification. So to give everyone a little backstory, uh, I did an interview on a podcast and I said that there's no such thing as gentrification. And man, it, it, it went viral. And here's what I mean by that. I understand the term gentrification as we know it, right? Uh, you know, I understand the history, specifically in Black neighborhoods, how our neighborhoods were used as, as essentially, man, like, <laughs> you know, uh, experiments. You know, highways were ran through our neighborhoods. Factories and mills were put on our, on our side of town. Like, trust me, I I'm, I have a master's degree in history, and my thesis was essentially the great migration of Black Americans, you know, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And now you have the, the return migration that's happening now. So, y'all, I am not cooning or shucking and jiving when I say this. All right. That is not who I am. OK, what I'm saying is this. I don't like the term gentrification from the standpoint of if it makes us victims. When we have the access, when we have the opportunities to control our environments. About five or six years ago, you could go down to the city of Dallas and purchase land for $5,000 in what they called a land bank. They were selling houses in South Dallas and Oak Cliff, Pleasant Grove. I'm talking about fully structured houses that just need renovations done to them. You can buy these houses for $10,000, dollars 20000 and when I was telling my people, like, yo, go buy these houses, like, stuff is about to happen. Like, I don't want to live over there. I don't want to live in Pleasant Grove. I don't want to live in Oak Cliff. I don't want to live in South Dallas or wherever the hood is where you live. And my thing was, I didn't tell you to move over there. I said to buy it, right? Because it's not that we don't have the money. We just don't allocate our resources. We got our money for everything else. Like, if somebody want to go on a cruise or somebody want to go out to eat, everybody want to turn up. Like, we turn up to, to a tune of a trillion dollars a year. Trust me, I get how, you know, redlining and I get how, uh, you know, a lot of segregation and things hurt us. But now we can't use that excuse if we are allowing our communities to be bought back. And what happens is you have redevelopment. Redevelopment is going to happen anywhere, especially if you live in a major city. Right. So how do you stop that? As a zoning commissioner, I actually learned how you stopped it. You stop it by going to those zoning meetings and saying, no, we don't want that over here. You right. stop it by, you know, if grandma or grandpa have a house and I live in the South, I understand that people who watch our podcast, they may live on the West Coast or on the East Coast or up North where uh, real estate is a little bit more difficult to purchase, but it's not impossible. Follow me here. But down South, mama and papa, you know, a lot of them own their houses, right? Like, don't sell the house when they die. Um, put a will, a trust uh, an entity in place that allows the family to control that piece of property. Because if you can control that property, you can control what happens around it. But what happens too often is, is that we chase white people. So when we get a little money, we leave our environments because nobody wants to be in the hood. You see, when you took neighbor off of it and turned it into a hood, a hood is something that you cover up. A hood, a hood is something that you don't want to, you don't want people to see. You know, when you, when you put a hood on, you don't want to be seen. We got to put the neighbor back into that aspect. And we have to start with one property. We have to start by controlling one property. Somebody watching this right now, they have an aging grandparent. There's no will. There's no trust. There's no life insurance policy in place. Like, get that shit together. Because once they die, things probate if you don't have anything in place. Or let's say grandma or grandpa went out there and got a reverse mortgage. Well, now you only got three months to pay that money back before they take the property. And that's what's happening. We give up our property because we're chasing something else, not realizing that the value is right here. You know what I'm saying? Like if you think if you study white flight, when white people typically moved out, when they just by numbers, just left the cities and went to the suburbs. Well, now you're seeing them come back. Why? Yeah. Because mainly because we going out to the suburbs to be with them. It's like, well, they come, they moving away again. Right. Yeah. But you know, if you said it out loud, you know, people cringe a little bit. I don't care because it is what it is. Right? right. So so there's no gentrification. If you don't own real estate, you can't speak on that topic. If you're not trying to take back your community, if you're not at those zoning meetings, if you're not at those council meetings raising hell, then shut up about gentrification. Because I, I remember conducting a meeting one time 
and this was on the white side of town here in Dallas. And it was an area that, for lack of better words, it wasn't affluent, okay? All right? But they wanted to put something over there that was going to raise their property taxes. And when I tell you 150 people showed up to that public meeting, and you have to let everyone talk for three minutes, and then you have to let the person respond for two minutes or three minutes. Bro, that one case, we sat on that one case for almost four hours. Hmm. And guess what? It didn't get approved because the neighbors were like, no, you're not coming into our community with that bullshit. But right. see, we don't do that. And and right. I held meetings every two weeks, public meetings. I sent out emails to every homeowner association in my district. My district was a, you know, primarily a black side of town, South Dallas and then East Dallas, which is predominantly white and Hispanic, but a lot of black people too. But essentially it's not, it's not a rich part of town. You get what I'm saying? And no one would show up to these meetings, but then these same people get online talking about they gentrifying our neighborhood, man, shut up. No, you're, you're letting your neighborhood go. And then when you do get the money, instead of just taking a year off from tricking your money off, getting your, you know, taking a year to get your credit together, taking a year to just buy one house, and you can rent it out. You don't even have to live there. One house. We don't do that. And I say we because this isn't a point fingers or this isn't a wag your finger at nobody thing. This is a we have to take accountability. If we really want change to take place, we can't expect the people who we say are disenfranchising us to all of a sudden wake up one morning and say, I'm going to do right by you. That's just not realistic. Right. So, no, there's no such thing as gentrification. There's a redevelopment. And you need to get ahead of that redevelopment before your shit get gentrified. <laughs> yeah. Um, where does that education start? Like, where does that where does that education start, man? Because clearly, um, soon as someone die, that house is up for sale. It's up for sale for simple shit, can't pay the taxes. Uh, four or five brothers own the lease and, and no one wants the other one to get more money than, you know, the other one. Nigga shit. That's what I call it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to put it. You know, nigga shit. Because we can, we, can, we can come together to do nigga shit. Like we can come together to do shit that we ain't supposed to be doing. But when it's time to do some business, we want to, oh, well, let me leave it in the Lord's hands. No, 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 no. Let's not, let's not do that. Okay. I'm not telling people not to have faith. I'm saying don't be passive when it's time to secure your legacy and don't be, you know, extremely active when it's time to do the bullshit. Right. Have that same energy. Right. And, and like you said, like I get people call me all the time, man, my grandma just died. She got eight kids, two of them in prison, you know, uh, uh, one of them out of state and they don't talk to him that much. It's like if you would have when grandma was alive, you would have put a, a trust. You would have if you would have took that tax money. You know. And, and instead of going out buying a new wardrobe or putting it down on a new car, if you'd have took that tax, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars from that tax money and secured grandma or grandpa's estate, you could be your family could have an additional two, three hundred thousand dollars worth of wealth. Yeah. But see, when you we we live in a silent, you know, within our community, we suffer in silence. Like we turn up out loud, but we suffer in silence. And when a person like me comes along. And says it, people either rock with it or they don't. And my thing is, if they weren't gonna rock with it anyway, they they weren't my target audience to begin with. Like I'm not here to to pacify anybody because I've watched it happen for so long, and I'm sick of it. And I know within the next ten years, there's not gonna, well, there's not the middle class is already eroded, and black people are losing statistically in every financial category, specifically black men. Like it's not gonna ever get better. It's gonna get worse, and then you're gonna be relying on. Again, the same entities that you are saying that's disenfranchising you to take care of you. And how well you think they're gonna take care of you? Right, right. So what's your <laughs> thoughts on uh what's your thoughts on wholesalers? I don't have an issue. You know, when I was when I was selling real estate like full time and I was really in the game, I had an issue with wholesalers. I felt like most of the wholesalers that I came across were extremely unethical. Um, you know, and it's a, it's an easy barrier of entry. And there's just a lot of shady stuff from my opinion that went on in the wholesale game. And it, it gave me scam vibes, right? But you can wholesale a property and make a good amount of money. And a lot of times, if you think about wholesalers, they, they target these areas that we say are being gentrified. So again, you got grand, I, I got a, I have a family member right now, a great aunt 
who has a house that needs a lot of work, who's behind on the taxes, and she just wants to sell the house and she's been entertaining wholesalers. But she's too embarrassed to call me about it. So her offsprings called me and I'm just like, why is she embarrassed to give me a call? Like, that's wealth. You guys need to hold on to that property. And so I advise my cousins of what to do. I'm not going to step on anyone's toes because I'm not a direct heir to the property. And if I come in and sell it, it'll give the opinion or the appearance. And I'm just trying to make a quick dollar because you know how we do. Right. But I'm telling them, you all need to get her stuff in order and you do not need to let her sell this property unless it's going to be extremely beneficial. One of you need to buy the property and keep it in the family and just rent it out later. You can take a loan off of it, refinance it, fix it up. There's so much you can do with it. But it's like me, Tim Jackson, real estate broker, author. Like, don't get it twisted. Like, I have to have these same conversations with my family members who don't want to do right. Yeah. So it's it's a never ending cycle. Like, I think that we think that people have it right and have it perfect. Most of my frustration comes from the people around me. I'm like, y'all don't see this. So now it's like, it's my job to just talk about it, but then show it. And that's what we do. We show it. But to sum up the question, I don't have an issue with wholesalers. Um, I, I have an issue if a person gives their property away to a wholesaler, knowing that there's an opportunity for them to sell that same property to a family member, because literally the whole concept of wholesaling is just getting it sold for a little bit more. And then they go sell it for a lot more. Well, shit, if you're going to get on the contract with them, for forty thousand dollars, get on the contract with me for forty thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying? Because all you trying to walk away with twenty anyway. You know you owe twenty, you want twenty, or it's paid off. You just need forty to help you with your assisted living or whatever it is you're doing. Like, let me buy it off of you. And I've done that. I've bought properties from family. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and then we keep it. We rent them out. We keep them in the family. Right. Right. That's yeah. Cool, man. So wholesaling is cool. I make sure I might dibble and dab in some wholesaling myself. Because that's a quick little lick if you run it right. But, you know, in anything, you need to have integrity. And I feel like in that industry, you know, there's a lot of integrity issues. Right, right. I can agree with that. All yeah. right, man. Uh, just something that we do, something new that I do <laughs> on the show. I guess it's, uh, we'll call it uh, rapid fire. Rapid fire. Let's get it. All right. So what it is, is we have uh, these caveats, man, that we believe that if you are able to, uh, adjust your life and, mm -hmm. and do these few things that you have no choice but to but to be successful. Absolutely. So I'll start off. I'm going to say a word and you just say first thing that come to your mind. Uh, it could be from your experiences or whatever you teach, you know, um, your followers. Let's do it. All right. Motivation. Self-motivation. You, you, If you don't love yourself, if you can't motivate yourself, then you can't, you're not going to have it. You have to be self-driven. Uh, you have to put what you want to become in front of your face every single day. You know, whether it's a goal with a picture next to it, you have to, to believe in yourself enough to know because motivation is, is a, is a, is a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a feeling, right? And feelings subside. So you got to be motivated when that feeling is gone. So I would say, look within yourself and do it for you. Don't do it for anyone else. If you're trying to do something to help other people, if you're trying to do something because it's for somebody else, it'll never pan out. You will lose motivation. But if it's for you and your goals, it'll work. Awesome. Awesome, man. Next one, mentorship. 100% necessary to be successful in life. Uh, I was not able to retire at the age of 37 without a mentor. Uh, a mentor, uh, the whole premise of this podcast that I have no more OGs is to eradicate the mindset of the OG or the big homie or the person in the neighborhood that you go to for advice and they're not really making your life better. They're just telling you essentially how to perfect doing a bunch of nigga shit. Uh, but a mentor will see something in you that they see in themselves and they'll pour into you and put you in a position uh, to, to, uh, overachieve and to, uh, to super, to surpass what they did. You know, if that makes any sense. Right. So every kid, every adult needs a mentor. And if you don't know nobody personally, then you need to find somebody that you admire and start reading their books and follow them on social media and start taking their word as clear instructions. And that's just your virtual mentor, but everyone needs a mentor. There it is. There it is. All <laughs> right. Uh, meditation. 
And meditation is, is necessary what you think you become. Um, so if you're thinking about a bunch of, you know, shit that's not going to benefit you, you're going to, you're going to fall into a bunch of shit that ain't going to benefit you. Right. Um, so I would say that, you know, everyone should go to a quiet place at least once a day with no phone and just kind of clear their mind. Um, and if you feel like you can't do that, then you need to get on your phone and record a bunch of your goals, you know, for five or 10 minutes or even longer and just read them to yourself. And then you need to go into a quiet place and listen to those goals and let those goals that you're hearing overtake your thoughts and your mentality. Because once your mind subconsciously hears those things, it's going to set out to achieve it. But meditation is, is very, very big. Meditation, prayer, fasting, whatever it is that you want to call it, then you need to do that thing that's going to you know help you speak to yourself within so that you can project uh, outwardly what you want to become. Man. Keys to the game. There it is. All right. <laughs> Movement as in working out or maybe even traveling. Uh, you know, uh, slow motion is better than no motion. I think a lot of people uh, in this day and age, they don't want to look stupid so they don't get started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, you know, um, done is better than perfect. Right. So if it's an idea or something that you want to do, like just do it, like literally, um, I was sitting up here doing some edits on a podcast and a week ago I was doing these same edits. And even though I'm really good at this stuff, I'm using new systems and I was doing terrible about a week ago. Uh, but now I kind of got this stuff down to a science. So, you know, you got to think about, you know, uh, momentum is like a train. Like once a train gets started, you can't stop. It takes a, a fully running train. It'll take a train up to a mile to stop. But what happens is, is once you stop, it can take forever. It can take a super long time to get started. So I would just say, like, keep going. Success loves speed. If an idea comes to you, the idea is the validation. You don't need to ask anybody what they think. You don't need to start. We got to stop going to the wrong people for the right solutions uh, and just understand that the idea that may come to you through your meditation, your prayer, your fasting time, uh, once it gets in your head, that's for you. So you need to go out there and do it. And that's that's pretty much my take on that. All right, man. Momentum is a good one. I might have to add that. <laughs> okay. Um, the next one is marketing, and then we only have one more. Yeah. Like marketing um, yourself, marketing your business. Yeah, self-promote. Like, post that shit. Like, um, you know, I used to have an issue with posting because I'm like, man, only a, a couple people are watching this, a couple hundred people. But what happens is you will post some one day, and it'll be the most random thing you post, and it'll go viral. I made a post on my No More OGs page that has gone viral. And I, as of right now, there's 1.8 million people that have seen it. Ooh. It's been shared over 100,000 times. And I gained like almost 6,000 followers off of one post. And it was a very, if you look at that post compared to my other post that I sat down and scripted, it was the, the vision. I mean, like the optics were blurry. It was just a shitty post, but it was great content and it went viral. And like, literally, that's how it typically happens. So if you got 20 people watching, like that's your target audience, like focus on them 20 people. Stop trying to go viral. Like. Focus on them 20 people because those are the people that's going to pay you. But just put it out there. Dang. And market just so nobody's going to market you like you. I agree 100%. All right. Last one monetization. Money. Um, you know, don't let the money control your decisions. You know, uh, a lot of people chase money and they don't chase principle. And what they realize is that you'll make way more money chasing principal, right? I've made more money volunteering than I've ever made running ads. Like we get too, we get too big for ourselves and think that, oh, now that we got this information that people got to charge us. Like I know people that, I mean, I have two pretty decent followings online, but you know, people ask me to do podcasts. I'm like, all right, let's get it. I know people that when I try to get them on my show, I've tried in the past. People are like, no, I need you to pay me. And I'm not saying that a person's not worth a dollar, but what I'm saying is that if you chasing a dollar all the time, you don't have any, you won't have any integrity. And so everything you do will be controlled by that dollar. Um, but always sell yourself. That's where the money comes in. Don't try to sell a product, sell you because people are buying you. They're not buying that product. I don't never sell houses. I sell Tim and I sell what Tim has accomplished. And if you know, the idea that you can accomplish it too, based on following these steps. And then I post those steps that people are showing me like, Hey, this actually works. So you know, don't get so caught up in the money that you lose yourself because you'll lose that money and then you'll lose yourself too and then you, you really be broke. Man, those are keys to the game, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, Tim, I really appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. You, you, you dropped a bunch of jewels for us, man. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Just give me a follow. I'm on social media. My uh, page uh, is at no more OGs uh, and then at Tim Jackson. Now, uh, like I said, click the link in my bio. Come come out and see us if I'm going to be in your city. Uh, I'm helping a thousand people, you know, purchase their first home this year. So home ownership is the plug. It's the play. It's how I retired at the age of 37. Get you one piece of property to change your life forever. Awesome. There it is, man. Um, I'm going to make sure I get you a copy of this and I'm going to Let's do it. I normally don't. Uh, it takes me a week or two, you know, just to um, edit it. But I'm going to go ahead and get this because I think it's a good promotion. Happy yeah, I think you need to get that out. You know what, man? Here, I'm going to challenge you. When you do these videos, I'm going to challenge you to take an extra hour afterwards and do that, edit that shit right then. Um, because what happens is that's the momentum. And then, like, right now, I'm getting ready to drop a bunch of podcasts this week. And the two people that I interviewed, like, they going super viral right now. So when people go look them up, they're going to find my content. So right. I would challenge you. Like, I used to wait a week, too. Man, I'm putting out podcasts like hotcakes right now, and people need that information. So I would challenge you to get it put out sooner than later. <laughs> That's a bet, man. That's a bet. I'm going to take you up on that challenge. All right, cool. All right, man. Have a good one, bro. Much hey, same to you. Take care. All right. All right.